Hello everybody, welcome to another IG Date DWF arcade repair video. I've got this non-working Atari Asteroids PCB from a friend to see if I can repair it. It's a revision 04 of this arcade game PCB. This port was tested on June 28, 1980. And at the time, they had already manufactured more than 139,000 asteroids games. This PCB has all original sockets and ICs. There were no previous repair attempts. The solder side looks clean, with no residues of any kind. However, there is a wire soldered on a ground trace and some contacts on the edge connector look burnt and damaged. The main crystal oscillator has a broken pin right where it enters the case, so it must be substituted. The owner of this PCB, however, already noticed this issue and sent a brand new crystal at the correct frequency. So I just need to remove the old one and install its replacement. Even the other side of the edge connector has a couple of part contacts. These are the plus 5 volts and ground power supply inputs. I'll explain in a moment why this is a rather common failure on some Atari Arcade PCBs. And of course, I'll show how I usually fix this issue. First of all, we need to remove all the PCB material that burned and turned into carbon, because that usually gets conductive enough to cause troubles. Also, any copper foil that's too damaged to be cleaned and thinned again can be removed. This is the schematic of the original Atari power supply. It's a linear regulator but has two additional connections going to the game PCB labeled plus and minus sense. As the description on the left says, these connections allow to regulate the voltage directly at the PCB input, compensating all wire and connection losses between the supply and the PCB. It's indeed a good feature. Here is the wiring diagram taken from the service manual as well. We notice that there are only two wires carrying all the plus 5 volt current and two wires for the ground return and, more importantly, all this current which can be easily more than 2 amperes is shared on only two connector pads, both on the 5 volts and on the ground side. Of course, every wire and its connector pad has a small resistance, and that's why the Atari engineers decided to use the remote sensing power supply. With remote sensing, the power supply will raise its output voltage until the voltage at the game PCB input, where the sensing wires are connected to the main current inputs, reaches the 5 volt level. But two pads have a very low resistance only when new. As the board edges, the oxide layer starts building and increasing the pad resistance to the connector. As this resistance increases, the power supply needs to increase the output voltage to compensate for the greater loss. However, all the losses turn to heat at the connector pads, and the connection resistance even increases as the temperature rises, and this creates a runaway situation if not addressed early enough. Of course, it's always a good idea to refresh and restore the thin layer on the power supply pads of the edge connector when we work on an old arcade PCB. And in the case of the remote sensing power supply, one possible solution is to jump the sense wires directly to the voltage output at the power supply and use the sense wires and connector pads to share the supply current. In this way, the losses are lower, because we now use three pads for each supply connection instead of two. Since I'm using a PC power supply for my asteroids setup, I've just used three wires for the plus volt rail and three for the ground retard. So, as we have seen, we start by removing all the carbonized PCB material. 
There we obtain a good amount of powder from an old piece of PCB with a file. Then mix this powder with epoxy to fill the gaps left by removing the burnt material. After that we try to reposition the copper pads as flat as possible in its original place. And then place a piece of paper and another flat PCB piece over the reworked area. And we clamp this sandwich and let the epoxy cure. The one I use takes several hours, but you can use a faster one of course. The piece of paper has the purpose to avoid the other clamping PCB to get glued to our reworked PCB because of the epoxy getting displaced by the pressure. After it cured we have some paper sticking to the trace, but we'll deal with it later. At this point we repeat the same procedure for the lifted pads on the other side of the game PCB. Again we start by removing the carbonized material. In this case not all the original copper trays can be salvaged. So we need to obtain some very thin copper foil to replace the missing pad before adding the epoxy. Don't worry if the foil is longer than needed, we'll be needing more copper foil later to complete this repair. The final step, as before, is adding the epoxy and again clamping the area with a piece of paper and a little piece of PCB. As before, we have some paper and some epoxy sticking over the contacts now. At this point, we clean all paper and epoxy residues from the pads using some fine sandpaper or a cutter blade. We cut new copper strips, more than twice as long as the original pads, and solder them over the old ones. The strips are then wrapped around on the other side and soldered on the bottom pads too. We can do this only because, on this game, the contact on both sides carry the same voltage rail, so always verify on the connector pinout if it's possible to wrap around the strips like this. The new copper strips can now be tinned. The excess tin must be removed either with solder wick or by sweeping away the melted solder with a piece of paper. While we are at it, it's a good idea to refresh the tin layer on the other parts of the connector. This is particularly important for the ones carrying the other power supply voltages. If we have some new copper strip exceeding the original dimension of the contact pad, we can trim it away with a blade. Since in this case the excess is at the end of the connector, I will leave it alone. Here is the final result. It is now possible to plug the edge connector when it's time to power up the board. In reality, before powering on any old PCB, it's a good idea to also do a careful visual inspection of the bottom side. In fact, Atari Asteroids board are famous for having long and trimmed pins under some components. And these pins can easily make short circuits like you can see in this picture. Here is another nice unintended short circuit. Powering this board on could give some nasty surprises if left like this. Of course, I've took the time to trim most of the pins that could touch nearby ones too easily. The first thing to check are the output voltages of the linear regulator ICs present on the PCB. 15 volts is ok. Plus 5 too. Minus 15. And plus 12, all ok. Now we check the CPU clock. It looks fine. And then the CPU reset signal. Which is pulsing, probably because of the watchdog. In fact, the XY video output is all messed up. And doesn't seem to change when flipping the test switch.
I decided then to check if all the ROMs could be read correctly, and unfortunately one of them lost two pins as I extracted it from its socket. The pins can be reattached of course, but I first programmed a 2716 EEPROM to substitute that ROM and I fix the original one if and when the board is running again. However, all other ROMs could be read correctly and nothing changed when I installed the 2716 EEPROM replacement. The next step now is installing an OP generator socket on the 6502 CPU and check all the address decoding logic. The Asteroids Service Manual has already a very good description of the logic design of this game PCB, so all we need to check when running on an OP generator is that all outputs of E4, L3 and L6 toggle to logic 0 as the CPU address is continuously counting and that there are never two outputs going low in the same interval. To make a long story short, all this part of the circuit is working fine for what I could see. Another small part of the address decoding logic is this one. Its function is to select either the vector ROM or vector RAM memory space. So we also check pin 10 and 12 of L3 when using the NOM generator. Even in this case, however, I didn't see any obvious problem. By the way, the service manual even has a very detailed memory map of this game, which is so helpful if we really feel like writing some diagnostic code to help narrowing down a difficult problem. In fact, a few years ago I wrote a small RAM diagnostic program for the Asteroids board, because I suspected that the built-in diagnostic were not able to find all faults. A link to the GitHub repository is in this video description. This code outputs the letter of the failing RAM IC by playing the Morse code corresponding to the IC position letter. However, also in this case it didn't find any RAM error. But now I'm sure that the board can address correctly all RAM segments, including the vector RAM. So far, we know that the address decoding logic is working. We also know that ROM and RAM data paths are also working, since we can execute custom code and that doesn't report any RAM issue. So the next suspect is the vector generator state machine, and I started looking for problems in this area. This is UA9. P9 is stuck low. On pin 10 is also stuck low. Mm. On a normally working situation, pin 9 and 10 of a 74LS109 should always have the opposite logic state. Checking pin 10 with the oscilloscope, however, revealed bad logic levels. In particular, the high level is too low. This can happen either because of a failed driver pin on A9 or because of a shorted input pin on UD8, and I didn't want to pull a possible working IC by guessing. So to decide which one is faulty, I can simply cut pin 10 of UA9 and check if the output lever returns to normal. After initially cutting pin 10, I also decided to cut pin 9, because I couldn't immediately figure out what was happening. Here is the input pin on the 8. And after cutting its driver pin, we still have a full drive signal here. Since the signal at UD8 pin 14 didn't look like any other signal present on any other of its pins, I decided it must come from an unintended short somewhere. And sure enough, after some careful inspection of the PCB traces, here we have some deep scratches that chamfer a few lines together. This is another common problem that happens when the PCB has no solder mask. One method to eliminate this kind of short circuits is to carefully remove all thin parts between adjacent traces with a blade and of course using magnifying glasses. Otherwise we could apply solder flux over the damaged area and reflow all traces. I prefer the second method when there are only three or four traces involved. 
Let's check again the HALT input on UD8. Now it's floating as it should. At this point I can solder back the cut pins on UA9 and see what happens. And yes, it goes fine into a trapped mode. As promised, I've soldered new pins to the damaged ROM, so if this fix works, this Asteroid Scan PCB will still run with all the original ICs. Here we have all the original ROMs. And it works fine. The last step of any arcade repair is checking all the inputs, like the coin lines, the one player and two players game start, and all the ship controls. Everything looks good, so I'd say this is a successful repair. As a final test, I've connected the game PCB to my homemade vector monitor. By the way, the owner of this asteroids board donated it to me. He decided he's never going to build a vector monitor for it. So again, a big thank you, my friend. But I still don't have a proper console for this game, so I can only fire and rotate in one direction, which is not optimal. I hope this video was interesting and that you learned something. If you have any questions, use the comment section below. It's all for now. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.